Live from Madrid, Spain, it's theCUBE. Covering HPE Discover Madrid 2017. Brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We're back in Madrid, Spain, everybody. This is theCUBE, my name is Dave Vellante and I'm here with my co-host Peter Burris. Kirti Milkote is here, he's a co-founder and CTO of Aruba. Kirti, good to see you again. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Absolutely, my pleasure to be here with him. So, I want to go back to when you co-founded Aruba. What was your vision? What was the outcome that you were, you were perceiving for your customers? And how has that journey manifested itself to where you are today? Wow, that, that, it goes <laughs> back a long time, Dave. <laughs> I was <gonna> we, <laughs> 15 years ago. <laughs> and do it in 15 minute increments. <laughs> Right, so, uh, you know, I, I spent my early days of my career at Cisco, in, in fact, building uh, LAN switches. Uh, and we went, uh, the big rage then was to plug into the network, into the internet. And we sold a boatload of these catalyst boxes to all sorts of enterprise customers throughout right. the world. And uh, around 2002, when I started Aruba, I spoke to a few customers about what's next for them around the horizon. It was very clear that it was not the next Ethernet standard. It was not about going from 100 megabits to 1,000 megabits. Like, you have a lot of bandwidth going to everybody's desks. What they wanted to talk about was how can I connect my people when they're away from their desks? And that naturally led to more of a wireless solution. And Wi-Fi, which was still very early back in 2002, was the answer, but when I asked them, why are they not adopting Wi-Fi? And they said, hey, it's not secure. It doesn't have the performance I need. It's not manageable. In other words, it's simply not ready for enterprise. It could be a good for the home in the consumer world, but not for the enterprise. So I took that as a challenge and say, hey, looks like a business opportunity. Let's see if uh, I can convince someone to pay me or at least fund my idea and uh, to solve those problems. And uh, you know, when, when, you, when you go with a business plan to venture capitalists, they ask for two things. They say, hey, um, What's your technology differentiation, which are all the things I talked about. We solve the security problem, the manageability problem, the um, uh, deployment problem, and the like. But they also ask you, why can't Cisco do this and kill you guys? And wh what gives you the right to exist? And uh, the thing that I learned about business is, if you're disruptive, it's a good thing, especially to the incumbent. And wireless was fundamentally disruptive to Cisco because we were basically, our value prop was, you don't need all these wires. And if you built a business on connecting people on wires, my business was about unplugging and still staying connected. So it was naturally disruptive and it, it led to, we didn't foresee the boom in mobility that we had seen. At that time, we didn't even have an iPhone or an iPad. Right. right? It was about laptops. So we had a fun time connecting the laptop carrying workforce in university campuses, in uh, enterprises and the like. And, uh, but, but our business changed dramatically in two ways. One was uh, when the iPad was introduced, our customers said, here's a personal device and the idea of bring your own device became popular with the iPad. Where employees bring their own devices and there's no security model to connect them into the enterprise. So we allowed them to connect over wireless and there's no ethernet on an iPad. You can't plug it in even if you want to. So that made Wi-Fi more of a pervasive technology. And at the same time, we were coming out of the 2008 economic recession. So there was a lot of, um, uh, I would say, demand for new ways to accomplish more of the same with reduced budgets. And so we said with wireless, you can really cut out the wires and lower your cost and yet keep people connected. And so that sort of gave us the boom. So, so so, so start as a technical challenge, yeah. and, and one that you just said, okay, I'm going to just dive in, yeah. and we'll see. I remember Bob Metcalf, Peter, at one point was asked the question, he used to, we used to work with him at IDG, you know, wireless or wired? That was, you know, this is back in the late 90s, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and he said, well, he's an Ethernet guy, so he, yeah. said he invented it, so he said, well, wireless is always going to be better. Yeah. He said, but I can't predict what's going to happen in the future. It's hard to believe that wireless isn't just going to explode at some yeah. point. I don't know why. And then this is, you know, of course, before the iPad, before the smartphones, yeah. you as well when you started the company. And then, and, and I would imagine the VCs were asking about the market potential. Right. And now you fast forward to, you know, the days when HPE saw the opportunity. 
I mean, it just seems so blatantly obvious now with the intelligent edge. So take us yeah. forward to where we are today. What's that? Obviously, the TAM has changed completely, yeah. and yeah. the wind is at your back. So Absolutely. maybe talk I mean, about so that. So last year alone, we have um, grown the business 21%, yeah. which is three times the market in terms of growth. And um, it's profitable growth because we are really a software-defined architecture. That one of the core differentiators of the business is it's not really about wired or wireless. It's what do you, what do you enable the customer to do mm. with this technology, and how agile can they be to use the technology to meet their business needs. And uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation, obviously, as part of HP, around the data center and what's happening there with hybrid IT. The intelligent edge is the complement of that. What the simple way to think about the intelligent edge is IT technology, which is hardware, software, services, that goes outside the data center, that's closer to the user, and delivers uh, basically on the business outcomes with digital initiatives that our customers are looking at. So I'll give you some examples. One is in the enterprise itself. The most simple example is take a workplace, take an office, and transform the office in some way. And the easiest way to do it is get it off your cubicle farms with desktops and mobile devices, make it an open collaborative workplace, which is what everybody wants. And oh, by the way, as you start to do this, not only do you raise the productivity of your workforce, but you make it more attractive to attract and retain the best and brightest from the new workforce that is graduating from colleges that are looking for these work environments. And the other upshot is that you have an idea of where people are, not only who is getting onto the network, but with wireless, you know where they are. That gives you a sense of how your real estate is being utilized, which I didn't know this, but it was basically you used to hire people to watch how people moved around and do like six month studies <laughs> of if your real estate is being used appropriately or not. Now you get it real time with analytics. And you can use that location to really create new workflows within the enterprise that are completely uh, not known. An example is conference rooms. If you look at how people book conference rooms, you go to your calendar and exchange and book it. The meeting may or may not happen, but the meeting is booked anyway. <laughs> and uh, so we flipped the model and I say, and, and said, instead of booking meetings two weeks in advance before they happen, how about we turn it around and make it just in time? Just like taxi, cabs, or limousine rides, right? They used to be, you had to book it in advance. Now with Uber, you just hail a ride whenever you want. You can do the same thing with conference rooms. Another example was not only do you book the conference room, but you can turn up the lights, turn up the AC. So a lot of IOT elements mm. to the workplace. So a very simple prosaic things like a workplace can be completely modernized using this technology. So that's an example of an intelligent, intelligent edge. Another is um, in retail, where customers want to, our customers in that industry, want to use the network, the wireless channel, to increase the engagement for the shoppers when they enter the stores. Today, if you look at a bricks and mortar experience, you walk into a store, it is totally disconnected. Whereas if you're shopping online, on Amazon, let's say, right? It has your shopping history, it'll give you recommendations. It's a very modern sort of shopping experience. So how do you bring that online experience to the offline world and make it real time when you're out there? When you're touching and feeling the products, you get information about the products. You, get, you might get some promotions. You might uh, be asked to consider accessories that go with the product that you might be buying. So it gives the, um, the retailer an ability to really engage with the shopper in real time. And that modernizes their business, right? So now you're talking about using IT to enhance revenue. So IT is no longer just a back office thing that you do. It's really to enhance the business itself. And we're seeing this in industrial settings as well, where the factory floor is being modernized to uh, ensure that new workflows are coming in, to, the, to ensure the plant equipment is being maintained correctly before things break down. So we see so much action, frankly, at the intelligent edge that the, in terms of just the market demand and the TAM, it's growing dramatically. Well, Peter, I mean, Kirti's describing, when, when HPE bought Aruba, I said, is this a strategic uh, 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 infrastructure, or is it just a great business? And what you're, you're describing is a strategic infrastructure, so. Yeah, but it's also a great business. So <laughs> it, it, you weren't, you know, HP might have originally thought that it was buying Aruba to 
uh, buttress itself in the networking business, to help make the networking business happen. But what's occurred is uh, Kirti and his team have helped catalyze this whole competency around the intelligent edge. And it's, you, you mentioned a couple things that I think are really interesting. First off, what the, what, when we talk to CIOs and business people today, what they keep telling us is, I need to think in terms of the event that I need to support and put processing compute right there yeah. at the moment. And I can't do that without great networking. So number one, network is a crucial feature of thinking differently about process and data, compute and data, right there when the customer wants it. You mentioned the whole notion of retail. Well, I do this, I think we all do this. We go into the store, we get the tactile experience, we look at the price and we decide to go home and buy it somewhere else because it's more convenient. Lost opportunity for the retailer. Yeah. You put compute and data right there and marry it with the tactile experience and you need Aruba-like technologies to make Correct. that happen. Correct. So talk a little bit about this idea of how it changes the way a business person thinks. How the intelligent edge is not just a technologist talking about stuff, but it's turn it around. How is it a new way of thinking about business that then translates into the intelligent edge? Yeah, so I think today when you talk about digital, right, it's all about, I, I don't see in the future any business that is going to be independent of IT. IT used to be a support function, but every business in the world can, can I pick years. up on that really quick before yeah. you go? We talk about the difference between business and digital business is data, full stop. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Data as an asset is the basis of digital business. Otherwise, it's all the same. What do you think? Exactly. So, and data for powering experiences. That's kind of how we put it, right? That's really what it's about. You, you talked about the moment, right? So, what they want to capture, the, 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 you know, if you look at retail, they want to capture the shopping experience. When you're in there, the data is about what they're interested in is in aggregate, where do my shoppers spend most of their time when they walk into my store? How long do they hang out? Uh, do they come back? How often do they come back? This is analytics information that they can use to craft their campaigns, to bring more shoppers into the stores, right? This is data. The data comes based on when you walk into the store and the asset that allows this data to be built is the network. The moment you walk in, the network recognizes you that you walked in by your device. And it now knows how the path you're taking. I don't need to know you, Peter, walked, but I know that a shopper took this particular path. And I collect enough data, I get patterns out of it. And based on the patterns, I then monetize it to bring the shoppers back. Now I marry this data to my prior existing data, like a loyalty card database. If you're in my loyalty card database, then I know more about you about your shopping habits, and that allows me to cross-sell and upsell to you. So they look at this whole shopping experience. Ultimately, it's about business. It's about how do you increase the wallet share of your spend when you walk into the store, and also to convert the sale when you're there. Not just do window shopping, walk off and purchase on Amazon, but make the sale happen. To do all of that, you need to crunch the data, you need to have super fast networking to engage the customer, and all that needs to happen in real time right at that point in time. And that's what the edge is about. Do you know, have you, have you heard the name, uh, I'm going to throw something out, have you heard the name Christopher Alexander? Yeah. Timeless way of building? Yeah. The whole notion that, that architecture is about creating spaces that are functional to people and make them convenient and attractive right. and useful. That's right. And in many respects what we're talking about is creating digital and real spaces combined at the same time that allows people to do things that are valuable to them. Fundamentally, do you agree with that? Is that kind of where Completely. we're going with this? Completely. Digital, as I said, right, today we think of digital as an add-on to the space. Mm. In the future, it'll be embedded. You won't even think about it. It'll just be there. And you'll just experience it as a digital space. It's putting the capabilities into the space that the customer, the employee, whoever needs to make that moment right. most valuable. And voice interfaces. If you think about Alexa Absolutely. and all these new things yeah. that are coming out, right? They're not much this. more natural. <laughs> You're not going like this, right? You're just walking in. You might have an Apple Watch on you. That's as good of a mobile device as a mobile phone, right? Mm. So I don't need you to be looking at anything. I just walk in, I can buzz your Apple Watch and say, hey, here's a coupon for you. Or you can just talk to a display and say, hey, tell me more about this product and you'll get information back. 
mean so, to you? Kirti, bring it back to Discover. What are we going to hear this week from the So one team? of the big, big things you'll hear from us is, as you think about all these digital experiences that we're creating, in whatever setting, there's one huge barrier to all of it. And guess what that is? Security. It is, absolutely. Security is the number one issue. And if you don't have a secure foundation, your digital business is at risk. And we have seen that in headlines, in bold headlines, in the last year, two years, right? So how do you build security from the ground up and give you a, a super robust infrastructure that gives you what you want but doesn't compromise your business? That's fundamental. Security is a boardroom topic. The CEO has to respond to how you're ensuring consumer data is not being compromised, patient data is not being compromised, or whatever the uh, sacrosanct data is that the enterprise owns about its customers. So we are talking about security and how you provide advanced machine learning and behavioral analytics capabilities to give you advanced warning about security threats that may be already inside the enterprise. Because there is no such enterprise today that is digital and not vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Everybody is vulnerable and everybody knows there's a threat. The key is how long does it take you to figure out your, you have a threat and fix it. And we are helping them figure out faster and fix it faster. And you brought in some assets to do that, Niara? We are going to be example, introducing yeah. this, uh, this idea, this product called Introspect. We acquired mm -hmm. Niara, yeah. which brings us to the AI machine learning world into the enterprise. And the key idea there is that security doesn't stop at the perimeter. You really have to in incorporate security from the internal, from the inside out, not just from the outside yeah. in. Great. Kirti, thanks so much for coming to theCUBE and uh, good luck this week, appreciate it. Thank you very time. much. Uh, you're welcome. All right, keep it right there, buddy. Peter and I will be back with our next guest. We're live from HPE Discover in Madrid. This is theCUBE. <laughs>